before I announce our speaker, I just want to say, please could you sign the forms going round to say that you're here, because that's very helpful for us with the BCS. And for the CCS committee members, if we could assemble after this afternoon out there for photograph. I'll try and remember to say so at the end, but if we could, that'd be really nice. For our 25th anniversary presentation, I'm proud to announce our eminent speaker, Doran Swade, MBE, and historian of computing, formerly assistant director and head of collections at the Science Museum. While curator at the Science Museum, he conceived and founded the Computer Conservation Society 25 years ago. His presentation is entitled Computer Conservation in Museums, Fight or Flight. And he'll be telling us, but it's an opportunity for us to revisit the creation of the society and it will encompass a review of the value of restoration and reconstructions of early computers, a signature feature of our program, to the process of history, society and museums. And he will review the current state of the society and offer a prognosis for its future. Doran. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> okay, as you've heard, the program is a rather heavy one. Um, I propose to speak for about five hours. <laughs> um, it's a huge pleasure <clears throat> to be able to see so many of the people who nursed the society from its founding through childhood into rebellious adolescence, into the vigorous rebellious adult it now is. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to, to, um, to see so many folk back. Um, as I will relate, one of the motives for doing it was that very satisfaction of convivial organization, convivial environment in which for people who care about these things to share expertise, share views and be together. And so <clears throat> it's with particular pleasure that so many of our past um, officers, uh, committee members and members um, actually um, are here. Um, <clears throat> what I propose to do is do three things. Um, the first is to review the founding of the society. And I will be concentrating on the first three or four years, because that is the period which I, was, I, I know most intimately. And there will be a, later occasions to actually review, uh, congratulate, commemorate the huge uh, accomplishments and achievements of where the society is now. So I'm going to look at it from 1989 to 1983, 94. Um, <clears throat> the treatment is a bit parochial, by which I mean it's quite internalist to the society. There are a lot of officers and people who did things that will be mentioned by name, and they may not be known to everybody here. So bear with me. Um, the thing, the program broadens out immediately after into um, looking at the relationships between volunteers, curators, and conservatives. Why do they hate each other? <laughs> So, so um, right folks, welcome to the Punch and Judy show. Um, we look at the power relations between them in relation to museums, and we try to understand what it is that underlies the tensions that sometimes emerge. I need to say right in advance, I do not believe any of these tensions are necessary. They're all resolvable. If <clears throat> an understanding and respect for differing views is actually can be the context in which these things are considered. Uh, finally, the um, third part of the talk is the social and historical utility of restoration and reconstruction. These are massive projects. They take hundreds of thousands of hours of people's lives. They invariably involve tales of heroic setbacks, of persistence, of financial issues, technical challenges. And the question is, are they any more than a form of heroic madness? Um, <laughs> if you ask the hard question, what value are these things to history? If you were trying to convince somebody who does not already subscribe to the view that these things are worth doing, what case do you make? So I will be looking at what have we learned from these projects? What could you learn that you could not otherwise have learned? And what state would history be in if these projects were not undertaken? And that's right at the end. Now, it's a huge program, and <clears throat> I'll see how we get along. Uh, it may be exceptionally, uh, it fits automatically into two things. One is an early history, which I say will be relevant to people who are involved in the society. I hope it will be relevant to those who weren't. 
The second bit is really to broaden it out and look at museums. What is the context in which um, restorations and reconstructions are, are carried out? Um, and it may be that depending on how we go, depending on how my voice lasts, depending on how many heads I see dropping, and um, uh, 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 to the extent to which we flag, we may actually have a break um, to look at the museological stuff later. So if we're around 45 minutes in and um, <clears throat> there are yawns, um, we, we'll take a break and look at the rest. On the other hand, it may be quite quick and painless. Um, on the of society, <clears throat> I was curator of computing at the Science Museum in 1985. I was appointed in 1985. Uh, the society was founded in 1989, so I've been curator of computing for, for um, f uh, four years at that stage. The post had been vacant for two years. Oliver Strimple, my predecessor, had gone to America, had gone to Boston, and had to help found work on as a curator. Uh, the Boston Computer Museum. He took a leave of absence from the Science Museum, went there for a year, uh, and this is under Gwen Bell, the wife of Gordon Bell, um, um, famous um, architect of Dex uh, uh, dominance of the mini computer market. Um, and after a year, he wrote back to Dame Margaret Weston, then director, and said, Could I stay another year? And she said, Fine. After the second year, he said, uh, Is it okay if I don't come back? Um, and so the post of curator of computing was vacant. The question is, why appoint another computer? Here was an opportunity to leave a post unfilled. Um, and the reason was that the public perception of computing, the, the general sense was that computers were going places. The public perception had been massively altered by the, the, the microcomputer boom um, in the mid-80s, early mid-80s. Um, and the general sense was that um, this was something that would need to be reflected and represented in a, a museum computer gallery. There was also a huge amount of visibility in the press. Um, that is that there was a kind of techno hysteria at that time. Uh, microelectronics was going to spin silicon into gold. The press was shouting at government to invest in industry. And the economic success of countries was actually predicated on their ability, supposedly, to actually participate in these industries. So there was a huge amount of public interest here. Um, as well as industrial as well as government interest, and the press actually was, was um, cracking the whip, um, uh, uh, frothing this up, if you like. So it was understandable that they would appoint, um, they would want this reflected in the collections, in collecting and in the public gallery. Um, and also there was an implicit, it was never told to me, but it was implicit that um, <clears throat> there was an expectation there would be a new uh, computer gallery in 85. The original computer gallery, the current one, um, was opened in 1975. Um, i have already been at the museum for 10 years by that stage. Um, it was not an internal appointment to become curator, but I've been here for 10 years. I was appointed in 1975, six months before the opening of the current computing gallery, by um, somebody called Arthur Rolls, who is here today. Um, and um, this was the gallery that opened in 1975. It was called Computing Then and Now, this brutalist, modernist um, design. Um, and 1985 was two years, uh, 1975 was two years before um, Apple, uh, uh, Trash 80, uh, TRS 80, and so on. Um, so there weren't any microcubes around, and computers were relatively novel. Very few members of the public had an opportunity of actually interacting with a computer at all. And one of the um, highlights, one of the main attractions of this um, gallery was that there was a live terminal to Imperial College which challenged you to um, uh, think of an animal and using the by zoological taxonomy, the computer would actually tell you what the animal was by asking sometimes no more than two or three questions. And the point about this was that the actual terminal wasn't very um, reliable. And some way said we should change the title from computing then and now to computing now and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those were the days. Um, <clears throat> Um, Arthur recruited me to work on this gallery six months before it opened. The contract was for six months. I stayed for 28 years. And um, Arthur is here. And um, uh, the one on the left, that's Arthur at his leaving due in uh, 1983, and that wild man is me. Um, and that the other two images are Arthur at Blythe House with, Chris, uh, with Tony Sale on the left and Chris Burton. Um, on the right, at the, and there's the up to the 401 you can see. And Arthur was the um, came back and was the chairman of the working party for the restoration of the 401 for uh, five years, from 94 to 98, um, I believe. Uh, 94, to, yes. 
Um, so um, part of the reason for mentioning that, it may sound a bit indulgent, is firstly to have a public opportunity of thanking Arthur for taking a risk on me and providing uh, and giving me the opportunity to experience the extraordinary things I was able to, the opportunities I had at the Science Museum um, in a career spanning that time. And also there's, a, there's an ulterior motive, and that is self-exoneration. Um, I'd like you to believe that everything that happened since was his fault. Um, so what was, the, what was it that led to the conception um, of founding a society at all? There's two main threads. <clears throat> and we have to go back to the culture of the museum at that time. So uh, briefly about how uh, the project, um, the, the new gallery was supposed to work, because the history of the society is intimately connected with a project called the Information Age Project, which was um, founded around, around about uh, mid, uh, mid 80s. Uh, the, the gallery project was called the Information Project, and the form it would take was a four million pound gallery here, and a center at Reading, which was a combination of a kind of conference center, a kind of networking hub for the industry, and an exhibition center. For the it was never entirely clear what it was to be. Um, uh, but the point is that the um, CEOs of the major companies acting in England, operating in England, were part of were the trustees. So these um, were um, ICL, Hewlett Packard, Rank Xerox, Siemens, Nixdorf, and Unisys. IBM was significantly absent, they wouldn't play. Uh, they had an internal policy that anything they sponsored had to be a sole sponsorship. They were not prepared to be um, uh, corporate sponsors or shared sponsorship. Um, so the IP was set up, these were the trustees, and they funded both the gallery and the uh, supposed uh, centre at Reading, which ultimately didn't happen. Um, the point about it is, the, the crucial point about the IAP is that the money came from industry, the money came from outside. So I was the project lead, I was the project lead director, I had budgetary control. It bypassed the internal dogfight for resources, and the independence that allowed cannot be overstated. I remember asking Morris Wilkes, how is it you succeeded when others didn't? And he said, they had committees to help them. <laughs> <laughs> he also commented that he had budgetary control, and he said the freedom to make decisions without the restraint of consultation, he said, quote, was highly unusual. And I found myself in exactly that highly unusual situation. I was actually free to disperse funds because nobody cared about it, because they weren't from grant in aid. They didn't come from any internal resource. The other element that was hugely favorable to us is that one of the trustees was Sir Neil Cousins, who was director of the Science Museum at that time. And Neil Cousins' roots are in industrial archaeology. And he, uh, he he's made a huge contribution to Ironbridge, which is involved in period reconstruction. We did not have to make a case for what we wanted to do. It was instinctively understood what we were trying to do. And the first thread is we wanted working historic computers in the new computing gallery. It was not something that required explanation at that time, and I'll explain <coughs> why. <coughs> the, the science museum at that time had a long tradition of working exhibit. It was known as the Push Button Museum. It started the entire Science Center movement, the, the, the San Francisco Exploratorium, the Bristol Exploratory. All these things grew out of the Children's Gallery that was opened here in 1931. The idea that you could have an expectation of having direct interaction with physical things grew from this pioneering exhibit, the Children's Gallery, which, which was here intact right up until the mid-1980s, replaced by Launchpad, which is, if you like, its descendant. Um, and people remember exhibits. I know people in the 60s and 70s who remember the Pulley exhibit. I know people who remember the coal mine that you went down. Yeah, I had seen nods. Okay, these are generations of people. There was a coal mine. You went down and went on a real coal body on a railway with the smell of coal in a dark tunnel from the, from the, from the concourse at the front of the museum. Okay, these were legendary things, and this established if you like, by example, <clears throat> the entire Science Center movement. So there was a huge tradition of working exhibits at this. It was an expectation. I mean, it's difficult to try and put yourself back in that situation where now you have to justify through a, a, a completely extraordinary process why you want a working exhibit on the gallery. It was not something that required any justification at that stage. It was entirely expected. You would see live working exhibits at the Science Museum. 
<clears throat> there were 600 working exhibits at the Science Museum in 1983. I know that because I was responsible for maintenance. <laughs> These were including three BBC micros that were so new we were still using beta test operating systems in EPROM. This was the first time for under 400 pounds you could get color graphics and we leapt on it. And, and uh, What I was doing at the Science Museum, I was recruited to design analog and digital exhibits for public display. So we designed and custom made electronic controllers, digital. I was fluent in TTL. Um, uh, analog and digital exhibits for actually designing, uh, um, uh, for uh, controlling public display exhibits. The basement of this museum, now exhibits there, this was before there were the generic computer platforms to actually provide interactivity. The basement of this museum, running almost its entire length, has workshops sufficient for 120 technicians, 120 engineers, technicians, and workshop folk. There's a paint workshop, a foundry, an engineering, a precision engineering workshop, and wood workshop. There were 120 people who exhibits were conceived by curators, designed and built by the workshop. What you came to, the, to, to, to experience at the museum were exhibits you could not see anywhere else. That's the groups of launch that all these were built here. Now there are about eight staff down there. The foundry no longer exists. The foundry exists, but there's nobody to man it. And uh, most of the staff are actually doing maintenance and cabinet work. Um, it's really quite tragic with these people, actually. Um, but I'll come on to that, because that's where the CCS comes in to some extent. So the first thread, the thing that <coughs> was, how did we get working exhibits into the museum? It was perfectly clear that the machines like Pegasus 803 and all these various machines in the museum's collections would require machine-specific specialist knowledge for all the prodigious skills of these workshop days. They were monumentally skilled, some of the leading people in the country. Instrument making, finishing, replica making um, was, was, were quite extraordinary. There were skills you had downstairs that you could not get elsewhere. I know that because we had to tr made, we tried to have things made subsequently and nobody could actually polish, polish brass without rounding the shoulders of the plate the way they could do down there because they were instrument makers. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is how to get it. Despite the prodigious abilities of these workshop folk, we needed specialist, um, we needed specialist machine-specific knowledge on computing to, to, if we were going to have any hope of reviving these machines to working order. So that was the first threat, getting working exhibits into the gallery. The, um, uh, proposed opening date for the gallery was 1991. That was the bicentenary of Babbage's birth, and that was going to be the commemorative gallery. <clears throat> the second thread that prompted the conception of the society was as a result of my, the experiences I had as a curator of computing. It would not be untypical on a Friday for the phone to ring at 4 o'clock with some distressed person in the middle of nowhere saying he'd just be notified by the department boss that the computer that he had nursed, cherished, maintained, and run for the last I don't know how many years was about to be scrapped, they needed the space, and we had a week to get rid of it. Could I do anything? I would go out in the middle of nowhere and speak to these people. <clears throat> and what became clear was that firstly, there was a massive amount of skill. Secondly, there was huge enthusiasm. And thirdly, almost without exception, people offered, if we wanted to put these exhibits on display, please contact them, they would help us prompt them and do whatever we needed. Uh, it was quite moving and quite pathetic sometimes that these that the, the emotional consequences of having projects and machines that they had cherished so uh, wrenched from them. Um, there were times where, as I left, they would sort of tug my elbow and say, could I visit the museum in store? You know, so, <clears throat> so asking after an elderly relative in a home. So what became evident was that these people were isolated. There was no social organizational structure for them to actually share in a convivial environment to share their expertise and um, to um, have meaningful work in things that matter to them. Um, so that was the second, the second thing, and we combined the two. That were the two threats: the need for working historic computers for the proposed new gallery, and the existence of technical expertise that lacked a social organizational framework. Um, so. That, that's how the idea was born. Um, the trustee meetings for the Information Age project were held at Reading. And uh, in, in a coffee break at a Reading meeting, um, I saw Graham Morris, who is here, and it was also one of the chairman, chairpersons of um, our management committee. I saw him standing there <coughs> while we were drinking coffee. I went over to him and, sat and started describing what I had in mind. <coughs> and um, I spoke to him earlier today, and he actually recalls the same event. Um, I, it, 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 it's something but I'll tell you about it, then I'll tell you about what. Um, so I went up to him and outlined this idea 
but, uh, and before I'd finished, he, his endorsement was both so positive and his conviction was so forcible that that actually is what consolidated in my own mind that this wasn't a daft idea. It was Graham who said, yes, of course, of course it makes sense, and that we could pipeline recruitment through the personnel departments of ICU and various other companies. We actually haven't had to do that. We've successfully attracted sufficiently many uh, participants, but it was his uh, the, the, that, that conviction with which he endorsed the idea that actually flipped me from, is this a good idea, can we do this, is it possible, to actually saying, okay, let's do this. So, on the 5th of September 1989, I, I, I made a presentation to the BCS proposing to them that they found something which I then called the British Computer Conservation Society. I didn't know about the specialist group arrangement that the BCS has, which made the word British redundant. Um, but that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the purpose was to create the site and restore working order, working uh, computers, and provide a social organizational framework for this activity. To convince the committee that they would be well advised to support us, um, I thought I'd tell them some of the exhibits that I devised for the gallery. And I started outlining them as a way of creating some enthusiasm for this. And um, one of them was a vast, huge wall clocks digital war clocks, which told the time in different number bases. So you had a decimal war clock, or a binary, octal, hexadecimal. And these were like um, a wall sculpture with no explanation. And they would register tacitly all kinds of things about number bases. Another one was the idea of showing the trade-off between precision and um, between precision and speed in calculating devices. So it was arranged as a, a game show, which would be videoed. There was a compare, and in each booth there was a skilled operator with an abacus, a slide rule, a comptometer, and a computer. And it would be given different um, tasks, arithmetical and mathematical, and you would put up your hand when you'd finished. The idea was actually to demonstrate this. And, um, and some of the results are counterintuitive. The abacus actually scored terribly, terribly well on speed arithmetic calculation. Of course, it was completely hopeless when you can't do mathematics and so on. That was another one. That, these went down very well. I then got up to my third exhibit, and this one fared differently. Um, there was a lot of fuss in the press at the time that um, Prince Philip's Prestel mailbox had been hacked. I don't know if people remember that. <laughs> and there was a huge debate about online security because the telephone company, the telecommunication company, were pressing people to sign up and get email and get electronic communication, and um, this happened at exactly that time. And what I, the exhibit I devised was to approach Prince Philip and get his prior permission that if anyone hacked his mailbox from our exhibition, then he would respond properly with a congratulatory message. And the idea was to challenge the public to hack into his mailbox. <laughs> uh, in my naivety, I thought, if I was somebody who was selling uh, security software, I'd want to show the public how robust it was. What I didn't realize was that the last thing any security company wants is for anyone to test the software. <laughs> <laughs> and as I carried on walking to my theme, I watched the faces around the table. And first there was sort of some pursed lips, and then there was some head shaking, and then I stopped. What I hadn't realized was that the BCS at that stage was trying to get hacking registered legally as a tort, that is to say, a legal wrongdoing that had legal liability for wrong or uh, harm or damage. I see, <laughs> I see Jim nodding there. Um, and um, they were wonderfully charming about it. They you know, sympathetically suggested that this exhibit perhaps shouldn't be pursued, and indeed it wasn't. Um, so that was the context. Now, I remember the meeting very clearly. Um, and the question was, what I have been able to establish is, what committee was it? And who exactly was there who was in the chair? Now, I remember I did not know Roger Johnston at that stage, and I did not know Tony Sale. Tony Sale was at the meeting. I don't remember, I don't remember Tony. I remember this presence of somebody giving such intense concentration. I don't remember him saying anything. But he was sitting three, three down on the left-hand side of the table. And let's remember that gaze. He was absolutely focused on everything that was going on. Um, I've spoken to Roger uh, several times trying to establish, was this the technical board of the BCS? Because if it was, Roger was in the chair. The upshot of the meeting was an absolute endorsement by the BCS to establish this, um, this society. And I went back to uh, the Science Museum, into the uh, Information Age project, which was in the old canteen, which we will hear about, in the huts, in the car park. And um, 
and uh, went back to, to work and that was the thing. The next day I was told I had a visitor. The very next day, this was Wednesday, I was told I had a visitor. I went there and there was Tony. Tony introduced himself. I didn't know who he was, but he introduced himself. And he said that he attended the meeting and I quote, I pushed all of his buttons, unquote. Those were his words. He said, you pushed all my buttons. I want to come here and work. I want to do this. So this goes back to the extraordinary freedoms I had as the budget holder. I immediately created a post at my own grade, a, period, a fixed period post for two years to be, and we cooked up the title, which was Historic Machine, uh, a manager, Historic Machines Program. Within hours, if not days, Tony had migrated from the BCS, he had taken up this appointment, and we were underway. Roger Johnston, um, there was a startup committee formed of Tony, uh, Roger, Ewood Willey, and Sandy Douglas. And they drove the constitution. Eight days later, the constitution was finished. The BCS had formally accepted the, the, uh, the Computer Conservation Society as a specialist group. Eight days, um, which was quite astonishing. So, um, Um, I've skipped an order, but I want to show you something. That's um, a Tony. I was be speaking about Tony because he played an absolutely critical role in the first 30 days. That's Tony Abeshi, part well known with what you call. This one is an interesting one. This is 1989 with Pegasus. And that's me next to Tony and the cat. Um, and as far as I can tell from the vaulting of the roof, that must have been, and perhaps Chris can help here, that must have been Blind House, not the old canteen, because the old canteen had a flat roof. Um, but um, this was taken by, the reason it's fuzzy is because it's taken by a Times photographer and all I've got are the contact prints, so I don't have the copyright to it. The reason I want to mention this is the cat. You see, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about later about evidentiary sources, objects as the ultimate evidentiary source. Now you see, I guarantee you in 200 years, some career-minded curator is going to examine the biological residue on that console. <laughs> and he's going to come to the inevitable conclusion that in 1959, which is the date that machine runs from, computers were operated by cats. <laughs> so this is where the importance and the integrity of the original artifact is absolutely critical in restoration protocols. Um, <clears throat> so, I want to just jump back to the old canteen, because those were the... Okay, <clears throat> I tried to find a photograph of the old canteen. The old canteen was um, the original staff canteen of the Science Museum. It was vacated, that service was interrupted, so there was this abandoned building, which is a single-story hut in the car park, the current car park of the Science Museum. It had a flat roof, which was leaking. It was not a des res, and I colonized it for the Information Age project, um, project team. My team of four curators that we were now doing this exhibit, we were advising the exhibits very more material for it, and that was our project. But nobody cared about us because it wasn't a desirable uh, property to have. And this is the only, uh, this is taken by John Liffin before these huts were demolished. Now this is taken from Queensgate. Actually, I've got a pointer here. Mm. This is taken from Queensgate. Uh, the entrance to the museum car park from Queensgate is there. You can see the clock tower of Imperial College over there. These huts were the RCA huts. They belonged to the, to, to the Royal College of Art, which is a block up. And they were used for storage and for the end of year uh, student um, exhibitions. Um, and um, our hut was nothing like as luxurious. It didn't have a pitched roof, it had a flat roof which leaked. And you went into the Science Museum through the car park around the back, and there was a single story hut which was assembled in about 1966. So that was our, um, and we installed Tony immediately. We shortly got Pegasus in the various machines um, that were there. Um, <clears throat> and it was called the Old Canteen because it was the Old Canteen. Um, and I've noted here that Tony was wearing his hallmark light gray suit, his white shirt and tie, and he was actually wearing a Mac, I remember very distinctly. Um, Okay, two things worth noting here. One is that <clears throat> public display and live demonstration were an essential feature of the motivation for the restoration activity. It wasn't just a question of being in an attic in some obscure place. 
People wanted to share with the public what was meaningful to them, and that was built in to the motivations of doing these things. So the prospect of putting these machines on display and um, having them viewable working in the, in the old country was a very strong motivation. The second thing is the notion of a club. What I mentioned, the convivial environment for people to, to, to do meaningful work um, and share what was meaningful to them and make it meaningful to others. The club, this, the idea of the social capital, I hate the term, social capital of what was involved, which is why it was such, I mentioned right at the beginning, such a pleasure to, when I, I mean, the biggest set of gratification for me is to sit around the table and see a bunch of guys around the thing, you know, um, um, uh, participating in trying to make things happen in an environment which is supportive of so doing. Um, <clears throat> right, there was an inaugural meeting on the 12th of October, um, and the purpose of those, 67 people attended, this is the main lecture theatre of the Science Museum, 67 people attended, and the purpose of this was to recruit people to the working parties, as we call them, now called the project team, to the working parties that would restore these machines. And we left that meeting with six working parties, for Pegasus, for Elite 3, for the deck machines, Adrian Johnson, colored current professor of computer science at Royal Holloway University of London, my current boss was there, he's sitting over here. Um, um, he was there and volunteered immediately to take on the deck working party. John Cooper, the late John Cooper, took on the Pegasus working party. Um, John Sinclair took on the 803 working party. Robin Shirley took over the S100 working party. We had six working parties by the end of the day. Um, Martin Campbell Kelly took on a software preservation working party, which was deeply intriguing at that stage. There were big concerns that the main great information age would leave less record of itself than Egyptian pharaohs because of the impermanence of magnetic media and the lack of standards by which these things were preserved. Under Martin, we met. I was part of that group. We met for three months, and we have disbanded. We came to the conclusion, under Martin's guidance, that there was no substitute if you really wanted to preserve something. And if you wanted to preserve digital thing, put it in barcodes, print it on asset-free paper, and give it to an archivist. Because there was no substitute giving the impermanence of the media in the absence of standards to guarantee its survival in archaeological timescales, because that's what we were talking about. David Holdsworth, who now heads up our software preservation thing, will be able to tell you what has happened since. This was way back, 89, 90. Um, but it, right back then, we were looking at these issues. <clears throat> So I want to talk about Tony, and uh, because the um, uh, because his contribution to um, the society is actually um, quite inestimable. Um, uh, Tony was the engine of the society in its early days. Um, <clears throat> he never bothered to say yes, we can. That would have wasted 0.75 of a second, and he could have made another dry joint in that time. <laughs> Um, firstly, he started the corporate sponsorship scheme, and our first corporate sponsors were Bull, DEC, ICL, and Unisys, and we had an income stream of £1,000 a year from each of these. Um, there was a one-off contribution from Allied Lines of £2,500, so immediately we were independent. And the freedom that financial independence gives, I cannot overstress. He played a major role in the, in the, in the creation of Re Resurrection, the quarterly uh, bulletin or publication of the, of the, of the, of the CCS. I remember the discussions about the title. There was anxiety about the religious implications of resurrection. Um, and um, Tony, not uncharacteristically, chose the edgy controversial uh, route and stuck to his preferred option, which was resurrection. He designed the first cover, which we'll see presently. Um, the resurrection is an absolutely remarkable chronicle. It gives a place and a home um, for data, information, and detail about British computing that will not have no natural home anywhere. It is an extraordinary historical resource. There are people who remember who was whom in which thing. They're not things that would necessarily exceed the threshold of publication in refereed journals. But this actually will be, it's an extraordinary document, an extraordinary resource for history, and will become increasingly so as these times become increasingly um, distant in the past. The granularity of detail about British computing is unequaled elsewhere. Um, the first issue of Resurrection came out in May 1990, and that is the um, yes, that is the um, original. Uh, that is the volume uh, number one, volume one number one that comes off my shelf, and this is the original um, uh, cover that Tony designed. 
And you can see it's all it's hardware. Um, it's pretty well hardware oriented. Um, to some extent, there's a, there's a bunch of tape and software, but um, um, that survived until okay. Let's look at uh, the inside cover of that. Gives with hallmark clarity and simplicity. Tony's with the help with the uh, uh, and the startup committee's formulation of what the original objectives of the society were: promote conservation of historic computers, develop awareness of the importance of historic computers, encourage research. It's so very simple, very plain, very simple. No frills. It it is it has been um, um, enlarged now to cover other aspects of our activities, um, archiving and so on. Um, but that was the original um, formulation of. The, um, I think that cover survived um, until spring 2010, um, where you can see there is a, a, a giving up, if you like, of the purely hardware into the recognition that software actually did play some part in computing, <laughs> even though many engineers would dispute that. <laughs> um, so we, we gave up the core store and the um, transistor circuit and put in a program. Um, so um, that, and that remains unchanged. The state. There have been two covers over a period of 25 years. It is now into its 67th. It's issued 66. It's into its 67th issue. The first editor was Nick Entignat, who is here, and he did this job for an incredible 18 years to issue 48, I believe. Since then, um, uh, Dick Leatherdale has taken over, and this journal absolutely thrives. Um, it is a spectacular repository for the data information, pioneers, anecdotes, first person, um, first person um, accounts of uh, practitioners, users, pioneers, um, and designers. Um, quite an extraordinary document. Um, <clears throat> yes, the cover remained, I think, in place of the first 50 issues, yes. Um, uh, we can see new uh, partners. The logos of the various institutions are there, but an additional is Manchester Muse uh, Museum of uh, Science and Industry in Manchester it became a partner. It is now actually part of the Science Museum, and um, as a result of which we don't know whether that will change. Uh, not in function in our relationship, and then will remain unchanged. The question of representation on the cover. Um, uh, Tony also established and maintained a program of lectures and seminars that have become a unique forum for the history of computing. George Davis and most likely Roger Johnson, as meeting secretaries, kept this remarkable show on the road. He marshaled and coordinated the activities of the working parties. In any given day, you can go to the old canteen with a bunch of happy folk buzzing around, whistling, coaxing these veteran machines into, into where with Tony, well, happy as a sand fly, buzzing around, giving what support he could. Um, Pegasus Elliot 3, the DEC PP8 were the first ones, 401, uh, the 401 drum was taken in subsequently. You organized in steam days. What? Pardon? Sorry, was there? No. Uh, he organized in steam days. Well, these were open days where people would come to the canteen. There were two reasons for this. One is to tell people what we were doing, so that's part of the reason we were doing it. Second thing was um, to show and convince our sponsors, our, uh, our corporate sponsors, um, that their money was being put to very good use and they were, we were doing great things. Um, we were never short of publicity for this because Computer Weekly was always our good friend. Chris Hipwell was the founding editor and the managing editor for 10 years was opted on the committee in 1993. We were always assured this was a gateway to the entire IT and computing communities, that they knew what we were doing. They, were, they covered our triumphs, less often our failures. And um, we, we, we um, um, so the publicity, these open days had publicity because it gave us visibility, convinced people we were doing worthwhile things and, and gave them samples of the kind of thing they would hope to expect in the gallery. <clears throat> um, the instant days were what are called an exhilarating carnival. They were joyous rumpus. It was a logistical problem. People would arrive at the museum and had to get to the own canteen. The old canteen is accessible from Queensgate. It's a quarter of a mile away from the front entrance. How would anyone come to the front entrance and know where this little shack at the back with the leaking roof was to get there? So I had no trouble with Tony. We organized a relay of people who would meet everyone who came to come to an open day at the front door and escort them right through the ground floor, a quarter of a mile away, to the old canteen. Uh, extraordinarily, I don't believe there are any photographs. There are some I've not been able to find them of these in steam days. That was Tony's contribution. You see the huge range of, of, of he was the engine of the society in all its aspects. Um, and now I'm going to embarrass, embarrass Chris. 
Chris Burton hasn't been mentioned yet. And I cannot remember the history of the site without Chris being there. Um, Chris uh, was looking after Pegasus in West Gordon when I first met him. And in a sense, Chris came with Pegasus, if you like. He was part of the box. <laughs> um, you know, Chris, was, uh, Chris minded Pegasus. He was the person who turned for expertise authority and moving and all the rest of it. So I can't remember um, when any aspect of society where Chris wasn't there. And he's played uh, throughout the history of the computer. He definitely <coughs> overstate the role that he has played. Um, Chris is best known, of course, for his for the remarkable, completely astounding uh, reconstruction of the Manchester Baby. Um, and at various times, he's headed working parties: LA 3 the 401, and the Pegasus. Um, he has stepped into the breach so many times I can't even count them. Whenever there was a problem, Chris would, would step in. If there was a, a hiatus in the service of one of the working parties, um, Chris was there. Um, he's been a source of wisdom. His profound uh, technical knowledge, the breadth of it, his professionalism, his forensic attention to detail, his methodical way of working, and what I call the firm diplomacy that he brought to almost everything he did. And he gave professional credibility to the site and continues to do so in ways that were hugely valuable to us. Um, his work plans, these are the stepwise procedures that you would undertake to restore a machine before that anyone was actually allowed to touch it, are actually models of actually you know, forensic method. Uh, they were quite you know, impressive documents. Um, he's a man of, of, of prodigious abilities, which he shares with generosity and modesty, which is quite extraordinary. So it's difficult actually to overstate what uh, Chris has won for the society over these years. Okay, so much for early days, how we got started. We now are in the canteen, we've got working parties, everyone's really happy. These are glory days of uh, conservation. There's one piece that I haven't mentioned. I've, ex I've described the whole thing in relation to me and the society. There's a mu museum that I was representing, and there was the issue of accountability. Every curator in those days, no longer the case, but it's currently the case, who acquired an object, signed a form which said, I hereby take responsibility for this object. And that was a pretty formidable undertaking to make. Because the curator was responsible for the physical integrity, for the deployment, for the exploitation, etc., etc., of the synology in all its aspects. It is not the case anymore, that is the case, and I'll show you why that bears on what we're saying in the second part of the, of the, of the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> The question was, volunteers are outside the chain of accountability. I was accountable to, my, to the head of the group. The head of the group was accountable to the head of the department. The department was accountable to the director, was accountable to the trustee, the was accountable to the work trustees, to the Minister for Education. There was a direct line of accountability of which I was, if you like, a volunteer as a curator. And the question is, volunteers are outside the chain of accountability of this very strict hierarchy. How do you extend the chain of government responsibility to a volunteer to alter an artifact, because almost invariably restoring machines to working order involves physical intervention of varying kinds. And the big question was, how do you breach the accountability gap to allow volunteers to be effective at all? And one of the things we developed was a set of um, um, uh, working practices and protocols that would allow us to extend that. And that was to do with um, with, firstly, staff induction. Now, one of the problems was that conservators have what, we, what I call an archaeological model. The idea of conservation and their training ground for conservators is largely, if you imagine the British Museum, with a shard of pottery. It is scarce, it is fragile, and it is improbably old. Industrial artifacts, the point about it, conservators are trained, are trained there is no training ground at that stage for industrial artifacts. There was training ground for conservators in fine art and in archaeology and places like the British Museum. The point about it is these protocols did not automatically apply, were not entirely appropriate to industrial artifacts, which are firstly robust, often exist in multiples, often documented to the extent that the volume of documentation is problematic in itself, as far as storage goes. They are unlike the archaeological objects on which their training was based. So these were the people, in a sense, that had to be satisfied. <clears throat> so what was a measure of staff induction to get conservators who imported this model, if you like, intact from the archaeological? There was no training ground for, for conservative industrial artifacts. They were coming here and imposing 
uh, or expecting completely automatically that these standards that were appropriate to artifacts in other contexts would automatically apply to industrial artifacts. A part of it was staff induction. And that was induction for the volunteers of the CCS about the fundamental curatorial tenets. And that is that the primacy of the original object in museum culture, the fact that the object is the ultimate evidentiary source, and any alteration of its physical fabric affects its value in that way. So it was to induct the volunteers into curatorial thinking, and the other thing was to try and re-educate conservatives that the very conservative, in the literal sense, of their best practice and protocols were not always, in all instances, appropriate to industrial artifacts. So what we did was induction for thing and also the introduction of formal procedures which required a written work plan, which is my mention of Chris's models of his work. work. The, the, the CCS had to come to the museum, me, um, and with a plan that says this is what we propose to do, this is what we propose to do, we're going to wire pin 7 to pin 9, we're going to change a blue wire to red wire, and this had to be signed off. So ultimately I'm still accountable as a curator, I'm still accountable as a machine, but my arm, if you like, is the CCS volunteers, and I am taking responsibility for what they do. That is how we bridge the accountability gap and allowed, because a curator had the authority, it was the only gateway to access to these machines. The only person that could give anyone permission to access these machines was the curator. <clears throat> Have I been going for 45 minutes? Yep, 46 to 23. My five hours was an underestimate. <laughs> Okay, we come to the end of the first era very quickly. Um, <clears throat> right, uh, right, the tendency now is to start speaking fast, so let me tell you a story about it and waste some more time. <laughs> there was a research seminar shortly after I finished my PhD. I was asked to summarize for the benefit of the people my PhD. I stood up and I had 10 minutes. I spoke very, very fast. And the person who organized me came to me afterwards and says, you're the only person I know who can summarize a 100,000 word thesis into 97,000 words. <laughs> So, I'm sorry, I can't do it. <laughs> um, okay, we've got this wonderful time in the old canteen, everyone buzzing around happy sand flies. Um, there were two things that were for changing. Firstly, the IIP lost funding support. There was a big recession, as many of you will remember, in the late 1980s. And the computer industry was very badly hit, and the, the main uh, trustees and funders withdrew their money. The money had dried up. The small change from that project built the baggage engine, and that's a different story. So IAP had gone, I didn't have independent control of the funds anymore, I had for a bit, but no longer, and my idea was just to continue to renew Tony's contract and definitely keep the whole thing that's shown on the road. Um, the second thing is we lost the, um, the, uh, we, we, we lost the old canteen, we lost our clubhouse. Um, it became a des res, there was, the titans were shooting out of uh, the turf wars and all that stuff, and we just became collateral damage. Um, and we were offered facilities at Blythe House. Blythe House is the Science Museum small object store in Hammersmith three miles down the road. The problem with Blythe House, it, it is a secure store. It is not geared for public display. So immediately we lost some core element of what was attractive for people doing these restorations, and that is public display, to share their excitement, their interest, their expertise with people who are similarly interested. Um, I managed to get a, a Tony one-year extension by allying him to a conservation project that were interested in learning what they could from our restoration activities. And to the, this group's credit, they were responsible for scanning and archiving 2,500 circuit diagrams. But the focus had been lost. The, the, the center of gravity had moved from complete autonomy to the conservation uh, group which had been established. And as a result of that, I was unable to create the loss of funding and the loss of the site. I couldn't protect only any longer. In 1993, he left for Bletchley Park. He started the campaign to save the site. He started the loss of resurrection. Chris uh, migrated to Manchester for the Manchester baby. And um, that was actually uh, a Pegasus uh, 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 restoration continued. And the 803 restoration continued here at South Kensington. But the, 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 there was a question of whether actually the restoration activity could survive. The, the facilities promised at Blythe House were not forthcoming. It was two years, it was a two year hiatus before we could resume them. And it was questionable whether actually this entire program would survive at that time. So they were not great times. The outcome, of course, was um, T 
GNMOC and match the value here. So, <coughs> Pegasus. Pegasus is highly topical now. The society has a special relationship with Pegasus. It was amongst the first batch of machines chosen for exploration. It was the flagship project of the CCS. We had absolutely no idea whether we would succeed. We had no idea whether we could do what we were trying to do. We had no idea whether we could restore this thing to working order. Pegasus was amongst the first batch and one of the first machines we got going again. So it was a very important staging post in our own self-belief that we weren't bats. It was quite exhilarating, this period. <coughs> this was, uh, you know, we, we could believe that actually this wasn't dark. We could fill and fulfill and realize the, the aims of the society. Um, this is Pegasus in the old canteen. There you can see the low, flat roof. Um, it's not 1998. You're absolutely right. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Lan. <laughs> um, that's the classic um, uh, for the 50s, and that's the machine currently in, in the gallery. Um, <clears throat> it went on display in May 2000, as Rachel has mentioned. Len Hewitt was the um, uh, is the last in a long line of distinguished um, uh, chairpersons of that working party, starting with John Cooper. Now, the Science Museum has lately suspended computer restoration. All, all restoration activities indefinitely. There's no technical reason why Pegasus can't be kept running. Uh, but the museum priorities have changed. Pegasus, uh, Pegasus will be decommissioned, it will be uh, dismantled and put into store. Uh, its end as a working exhibit on display, it's, uh, it's also the only machine that's put on public display, the only uh, real legacy, if you like, of the IAP project, that is to put machines, a working machine on display, was Pegasus. Um, <coughs> It's still up on the second floor. Um, it's, it can still be seen there. It's a remarkable achievement to kept this 959 vacuum tube machine working for the last quarter century. Uh, it's going to be put in store. Its end as a working exhibit on the slate of the public at South Kenya symbolizes the end of a quarter century of collaboration um, in restorations with the Science Museum and the CCS. We're indebted to the Science Museum for the supportive platform it provided in the founding years of the CCS. And we understand that Pegasus does not fit into the current plans for gallery development. If I was curator now, I would struggle to know where to put Pegasus. It's not part of the history of telecommunications. It is, but very indirectly. It doesn't fit into telecommunications. There is no computing gallery. It's going to be gutted and a maths gallery is going to come. I would struggle to know where to put this. So it's not without understanding to say it doesn't fit into the current development plans. But nobody should be in any doubt. I regret it the decision for the Science Museum to terminate restoration is, and more of the strength of feeling and the disappointment that such action provokes. It's understandable that it's happening, but it actually it is deeply symbolic that it's happening now. I've written a moment of tense silence. Thank you. I'm happy to report that on the 25th anniversary of the CCS, it finds itself in good health, and Rachel has given an excellent um, snapshot, profile of the respects in which that's true. It has over a thousand members. It circulates resurrection to over a thousand people uh, four times a year. And the main restoration and reconstruction projects, as we know, have migrated elsewhere, Manchester, TMOC primarily. And um, in concentrating on these early years, uh, there will be time, there will in time be occasions to celebrate the remarkable achievements of um, what's going on elsewhere. What I want to look at very briefly, and then we'll end the first session, is if we go back and look at what's happening at TNMOC now, and those are the original aims of the institution, we can see, well, as far as I'm concerned, TNMOC and what is going on there, the convivial environment, and the huge technical thing, and the range of projects, I think 16 projects, um, CCS projects, most of them were there, um, is that this, to me, TNMOC is a, a, a modern, if you like, a latter-day realization of everything we aspire to, when we founded the thing to begin with. I haven't mentioned Kevin Morrill. Um, I'm, I'm so bad, so I'm not going to. I am. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin's contribution to behind the scenes and publicly has been utterly monumental, both to Kevin and to the society. And I'm not going to elaborate on that now. I just want to say that, that is the case, and I look, for an uh, I look forward to an opportunity where one can elaborate those in much the same way as the people who contributed to getting us to where we are now. I propose now, since I've been going now for 53 minutes, 
to that we have a break, we have to have a break. We come back in five, ten minutes, ten minutes, five minutes? What? Five minutes. Come back in five minutes. And uh, we'll then uh, step back from the, from the granular detail um, and look at more broader issues about business development. Thank you. Uh, there's a small piece of um, business I didn't finish in the last section, and that is um, to actually uh, acknowledge the people who have guided the society um, to the place it is, and those are the, ch uh, the chairpersons of the committee. I call this the table of chairs. <laughs> and these are the folk who have actually guided the society through their own leadership and all the efforts they put into getting it where it is. Um, I was going to finish the last section um, on the prognosis for the society, which is sort of something that was promised in the blurb. Um, so let me say something, maybe a bit obscure, I'm not entirely sure I understand it myself, but there's something about what it is that unifies engineers, what kind of club they belong to. It's quite difficult to articulate what that is. So I think that the underlying drive for creative expression by engineers, technicians, and pioneers, practitioners, I think I, I feel that, that whatever that drive is, is actually irrepressible. I see the growth and huge success of TNMOC as confirmation of this, indeed the growth of specialist museums in Europe that work all their historic exhibits. Um, especially, for instance, the Analog Computing Museum, for instance. There are others um, that, that have all their working exhibits um, working. Um, the Science Museum in this context very happily provided the context for the start of this movement, and it's permanently to, to its credit that it did so. And, that we should never lose sight of that. The museum has 121 separate collections. Computing is only one and far from the largest. So it's understandable that the kind of attention we would like given to this, actually the museum are unlikely to be able to afford um, in the future. Um, the point is we've outgrown our parental home. We've outgrown the host institution. With Pegasus running, while Pegasus was still running, we sort of occasionally visited home on weekends or alternate weekends. Um, but the occupants of the family home have actually changed. And I think it's pointless banging on the door. They can't hear us. And so I don't think that that is something that is politically worth. I don't believe that those trends and movements can be reversed, nor would it be productive to try, through advocacy, through complaining, and all these things. The museum has a very clear direction now. It, it, was a, it had lost the plot for the last 15 years, from 2000 on. It had six directors, the longest serving one of which was six months. That direction was gone. It now has a very clear direction. Objects, collections are at the center. It's the last of the National Museum to recover from um, the, um, the, uh, the Cultural Revolution that happened in the 80s, where people went towards populism where people went towards um, performance indicators about the constituencies of visitors that were coming. Both, first it was the VNA, which went back to the British collections. It had, the VNA had less than one million visitors at one point, which is absolutely disgraceful. It then woke up and realized that it's unique selling point. What it has that nothing else has its collections. The British galleries restored it. The VNA has been a research, in, sorry, the Natural History is a research institution. It has up to 300 practicing scientists there. The public display is an expression of that. The Science Museum has, I was the last chartered engineer here. I don't believe there are any more chartered engineers. Curators are historians now. Curators of technology are primarily historians. I'll be dealing with this when we're talking about museums. But the point about it is <coughs> that, that um, the arena of expression was the public galleries for working exhibits. That has changed. And I don't think that can be reversed by advocacy now. Because there is a very clear direction. We're not dealing with an incoherent organization. We're dealing with an organization that has a very clear master plan. They know what they're going to be doing. If Pegasus doesn't fit work, then there is a criterion of relevance that is applied. And I'd say that politically it is counterproductive to try and reverse that through advocacy. And that is the conclusion I've come to after consultation with our members of our committee in the Science Museum. Um, so I don't think that these perceptions can be changed. Um, so what is about the prognosis of the society, if that is the case? Um, 
Firstly, we migrated away. That's already largely happened. Most of the restoration activity doesn't happen at the Science Museum. That's regrettable, but it is the case. Um, and that it, that's activity will continue to uh, will carry on. I have absolutely no idea. Well, I think when the world is tired of flat screens and fashionable history, we'll still be there with the real thing. And there's nothing like the real thing. And it just so happens that this isn't the most appropriate forum for the center of activity. It's an appropriate forum. We hope for further collaboration. We hope when they do, they're not opposed to uh, working exhibits and galleries. They just need to be highly selected because it needs to fit in to a core curatorial interpretive program. And we hope and we will be available and ready and cooperative to participate in any respects in which the museum does wish to restore machine. We're not going off in assault. I would, su I would suggest we shouldn't go off in assault. Because we shouldn't, in the fit of peak, um, uh, take any act to disaffiliate. Uh, the, the, the machines and the museum's collections are of huge value to us. Um, <clears throat> so, I think that what is enduring is the wish to make things and to make them work. Because I think doing so affirms existence for people involved in technology in ways that almost nothing else does. And I think that is what is not understood outside the club of people. There's something that unifies engineers. And I've been struggling for many, many years to find out what that is, or trying to get some idea what it is. It's to do, to me, I think, I, my earliest memories are making things. I cannot remember when I wasn't making something. And um, the question is, why is that significant? I mentioned this to a medical anthropologist who was a friend of mine. And he looked at me in blank and said, because making things affirms existence. And I think that is something that makes something about engineers and the wish to externalize what they do what makes that irrepressible. And I think that will continue, and it will find different locations in which to thrive. This was a fertile and supportive um, uh, nursery for that activity in the early, in the late 80s, early 90s. And that, but what is enduring and is unchanging is the wish to find environments to continue it. And I mean, TMOC is the next, is the first next stop. So as far as the future of the society goes, I don't believe that whatever drove it originally is diminished in the slightest. Right, beginning of part two. This is to do with, I'll leave that there because that deserves to be there. Um, volunteers, curators and conservators, why do they hate one another? Okay, not everyone hates everyone else, but to, I'll put that in there to stop you going to sleep. Um, but to pretend that the relation between these groups is universally harmonious would be wishful. Okay, the question is, what is at the basis of this? Um, <clears throat> judging by the number of museums that have approached me to try and resolve conflicts between curators and volunteers, it is clear that whatever issues are, are at stake here are widespread. And I'm basing this on three museums in this country, and museums in Holland, and in the United States. There are generic problems between curators, uh, conservators, curators, curators, conservators, and volunteers. And the question is, we've hinted at some of them earlier, the question is, <clears throat> what is at the root of them? What is at the root of them? How can they be resolved? In Holland, for example, there is no state-funded science museum institution to establish best practice protocols. There's nobody to administer control, either in an advisory capacity or a constitutional statutory uh, category. Um, historic machines are in the private hands of private collectors. They buy them from corporations and are absolutely at liberty to do whatever they like with them without intervention or subject to controls of any form of um, uh, best practice protocols, preserving fabric as an preserving the machine as an evidentiary object, as a museum artifact. It's outside the chain of accountability. Of, and they are deeply envious of the state uh, funded museums in this country that have a center of expertise of this kind. <clears throat> in the United States, being a curator is a low status profession. It's lowly paid. The hierarchy in Silicon Valley is top of the pile of, of, of venture capitalists, next are CEOs of major companies, Hewlett Packard, Adobe, Google, Microsoft, um, um, and next down are, uh, you know, and so on and so on. Your, it's, it's a mono, it's a monoculture in Palo Alto, for example. Your status, your social status, depends on your seniority in one of the major companies. Um, very frequently, volunteers who lead restoration programs out there 
are senior members from industry. There are people who ran R&D departments. There are people who are used to power. Over there, curators, I wouldn't say they're clerks, that's derogatory. But they are not high status people. They do not build power. There is absolutely no question that in those environments, and I don't just mean the History Museum, which is in sort of the other museums, there, the power resides with the volunteers. And they see curator, curators fussing about integrity volunteers as just bureaucratic obstruction. And the idea that a curator and a conservator inhibiting the activities of volunteers being a bureaucratic abstraction is pretty widespread, judging by the number of museums that I've been invited to speak to the volunteers to inculcate into them the fundamental curatorial principles of the primacy of the object in a museum culture. It is widespread. I mean, it is not something, uh, you know, things are pretty good here in comparison compared to some of the fights out there. The idea of chainsaw restoration is a word that was, was, was coined there which is the idea that some guy who is not imbued with these ideas about, um, about uh, the primacy of the artifact and the idea of evidence as, uh, as history, of basically chainsawing a piece of one machine, bolting it onto another machine, regardless of the contemporaneous matching and of anything else, to get it to work. So, um, so it is not something unique to this museum. It's not something unique to the CCS. It's, it's, it's prevalent wherever there are volunteers coming into contact in a, a peculiar power relationship with the host institution. <clears throat> Unlike America, curators in, in national museums in the UK, in the UK, a cura cura curators are fairly still high status profession. Um, that is because of the role of history in European culture, which is unlike in America. I don't mean that in a it's just the case. Um, and uh, it's reflected in pay levels, um, uh, particularly now during austerity when the private sector isn't as prosperous as it was during the boom years. Uh, civil service, public sector is actually not as disadvantaged as it has been for decades. It was assumed if you were a private sector, you were in the private sector, you were willing to sacrifice earning power to serve the public for some higher ordeal or for an easy life. Um, and that the big vigorous guys um, um, were the private sector. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in America, being a curator and to some extent being an academic in the humanities is what Schwarzenegger would call girly work. Um, real men did not become curators. Real men made money. Um, that is the culture out there. It is pretty, in Silicon Valley particularly, it's much more moderated as you go east. So we're talking about the power relation between groups of people that are part of the micropolitics of the host institutions in which these restoration activities occur. There is something also <coughs> There's been a shift. <clears throat> Before 2000, the curator of physics was a physicist. He had been a practicing physicist, or she had been a practicing physicist. The curator of mechanical engineer was a professional mechanical engineer. Now those classic divisions, and the, the departments in this uh, museum were divided, as you imagine, a classic uh, campus. Chemical engineering, physical engineering, mechanical engineering, engineering, and a service department. And the curators were kings. That has all changed. Most curators now are historians. Many of them have never been in a lab or a workshop. The, the, the emphasis has shifted entirely away from what we call the technocentric view of history, that machines make history. Um, the steam engine caused the Industrial Revolution which changed the world. The prime mover was the steam engine. The prime mover were the railways. It changed what it. The Gutenberg Press changed power relationships. It was driven from the technology, technocentric view of history. Now with historians coming, following movements in other, in the arts and humanities of relativism and the various modifying and moderating influence of the 60s and 70s, curators tend to be historians. They come with the view that history makes machines. Machines are the, if not the outcome, they are factors of economic, of social, or of, 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 of user acceptance that influence the way in which machines, so history makes machines and machines make history. So it's been a shift from a technocentric view in history in almost all museums towards um, the idea to, uh, to the, 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 the history making machines, more, more sociological and historical perception of the way technological trends happen. And so curators now, so if we look at arenas of expression, I was the last childhood engineer, I don't believe there are any engineers on staff anymore. Doing what we do, which is restore machines, was it an arena of natural expression? It's how I express my professional, personal um, uh, proclivities, interests. Um, that emphasis has shift, shifted. 
So the reward structure in terms of professional gratification for the kinds of curators we have to now make bids to change their attitudes is not going to succeed. They come from a different constituency. They, they, and these are not criticisms, these are just descriptions of cultural movements within the museum. It also is connected with the move from curators as being in control to curators as collaborators. Curators now input, together with conservators, input into a process that neither absolutely controls. So this is true. Before, a curator was the absolute determinant of the fate of the object. Whether I took any notice of what a conservator said was entirely up to me. I would take advice, of course. But ultimately, if we want to section that machine, it's a curatorial decision. The curator balanced educational benefits, social benefits of public display, if there was a conflict with that and preserving you know, the, the, the physical fabric of the machine. Often enough, there wasn't, because they were duplicated. Often enough, there wasn't, because um, the, the machine, um, uh, uh, there, there were others elsewhere. There were many, many reasons why it was perfectly legitimate. Originally, in the, in the gallery, you'd see a mini miner cut in two with a chainsaw. Yep, I don't know if people remember that exhibit. Okay, that wasn't the only working exhibit. A conservator coming along and saying all objects touching them is a no-no um, is patently um, not appropriate. So uh, the, the, the world has shifted, the cultural world. Who curators are now are not the same as the curators that favoured the environment in which the society had its founding years. The arena of expression is not necessarily anymore the, the internalist, the, internalist, the detailed, granular, uh, how things work, what they do. It was very much part of the tradition then, but is less so now. There's also issues of the values of, of, of the values of engineering culture and the values of the museum culture. Engineers come from an engineering culture. They take pride in being able to fix things and make them work. That is not necessarily, and curators come from an entirely different thing. When a machine comes through the portals of that, uh, of this institution, I hereby take responsibility for this object. You're responsible for the physical integrity of that object. Whether it, the, the question, so what engineers take pride in, what curators take pride in, is different. So when it comes to intervening in a machine to change something in it in order to restore it to working order, we talk about different cultures. So part of the problem with engineers coming from industry who come in without any induction into museum thinking, into the curatorial culture about the primacy of the object, you have inevitable conflicts. Inevitable conflicts. An engineer may fix, if you, he would take pride in fixing the machine with a paperclip. It doesn't matter if the original didn't have a paperclip. It doesn't even matter Perhaps even that the paperclip he replaced was a contemporary with the original paperclip. The point is, his pride is in getting this to work. His pride is in getting, that's what engineers do. Um, and so, unless there is some re-education of both sides, that one, from the conservation side, it's not always appropriate to say intervention is a no-no. On the other side, for engineers saying, the criteria that legitimize intervention are different here. And they are subscribed to different tenets, protocols, and working practices. So it's not so if the power, say as in America, rests with the with the volunteers, or well, usually senior members of the industry, often friendly with the trustees, um, want to do a restoration, um, and the curators say, you know, <clears throat> hang on, is that push button contemporary with the, the push button you're replacing? Is that contemporary with the original machine? And they see this usually as inappropriate and essentially obstructive, and in consequence, curators are, are often seen as spoilers. So, for the avoidance of doubt, I think it's an illegal expression, let me make clear that the CCS volunteers are unconditionally respectful of curatorial authority. I don't think there's any instance in which that has not been the case. And they've been acutely aware that access to the machine in the national collections is a discretionary privilege that they do not take for granted. And it was clear when I was a curator, and I don't believe it's any less clear now, and I don't believe that there's any, any activity or conduct that has ever challenged or undermined that. In smaller museums, especially special topic museums, the power relationships are often different. Volunteers, often these museums do not have permanent staff. It's only large museums that are conservatives at all. In fact, this museum, until 1992, had one conservator and one creef. Um, only large museums, the Victorian Albert Museum, um, the British Museum, have large numbers of conservatives, because these are established professions in, these, uh, in the fine arts and in archaeology. They're not established professions, they were not established professions in um, in the, uh, 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 museums specializing in industrial artifacts. Mm. So small museums, volunteers, or rather volunteers, they have a strong sense of ownership of those collections. And when those museums try and professionalize by bringing in permanent staff, 
there is almost invariable conflict. And it's in, 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 more than once have I been brought in to try and give induction courses to volunteers, to try and explain what the fundamental tenets of tutorial life are, so that they would respect the objects, not they would not vandalize them in any way. But they may not have been as sufficiently well sensitized to the issues, the museological issues. They, once an object changes its status from an engineering artifact to an object in a collection. And the protective protocols that are associated with I undertake um, I, I hereby undertake to, to um, I hereby under, uh, take responsibility for this object. The protective protocols and measures that kick into place at that point uh, are absolutely very different from the kinds of things that you would uh, would would, um, would moderate conduct in an engineering context. Um, within, I mentioned that the um, collections management group at the Science Museum started in 1992. Interesting, that's the same time that things um, uh, uh, did not go as well as they had gone here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, this movement in the 90s was to transfer controls that were in the hands of curators into others. Some went to conservators, some went to the documentation people, some went to the and so on. And this transfer of power away from curators meant that the curator did not have the ultimate say in the fate of an artifact. Um, and that, as I say, it, became, um, it was collab uh, collaboration rather than control. <clears throat> the idea that anything other than mothballing an object is a no-no is not absolute and is not universal. It's not absolute and it's not universal. The fact that once an object is a museum artifact, you should passivate it in order to prolong its uh, physical life. And I will illustrate that with that thing. These are Babbage's calculating wheels. There are six of those, very similar, that were sent by Babbage's son after Babbage's death and sent to major centers of excellence around the world. One went to Harvard. I went to Harvard to visit it in the museum there. I went in and I said, I've come to have my appointment. So I went there and this was on a trolley. No, this one's the science museum one. It was on very similar. On a trolley waiting for me. And I looked at it and said, that's very interesting. And I said, could I photograph it? And they said, yes. And I looked at a loss. I said, can I have some cotton gloves, please? And they looked at me as I was mad. And they said, there's a booth over there set up for photography. Uh, take it. So I said, you mean lift it up? Yes. Lift it up. He said, you want to use it? That's fine. Right? OK. There were no floods. <coughs> There was no bolt of lightning. We were not, the plagues were not visited unto us. <laughs> there was no physical law were broken. The speed of light remained the same. Um, I think the raptures were deferred for at least until the next banking crisis, which I think is next week, coming to somewhere close to you. Um, these are not absolute rules. These are not absolute. It's a decision you make about balancing the utility of an effect. They had made a judgment that in educational terms and historical terms, it was more valuable if this device was used. They, it was a judgment. It wasn't a, curatorial, a piece of curatorial blasphemy. So, just to point out, these uh, protocols are not absolute. So, these are some of the museological issues. The change in the constituencies of where curators come from. The power relations between volunteers and staff people who are accountable in the chain of responsibility within the institution that volunteers are not. And I explained how the Pegasus is the best ground. The Pegasus is the best ground. We actually um, did this by induction and by um, uh, working practices. When troubleshooting tensions between curators, conservators, and volunteers, I use a device called the Polian's waistcoat button. And it's been published, so people may be aware of it. And the point about it is, none of these tensions are necessary. The underlying tensions are completely resolvable. If it is understood why it is you're preserving the object in the first place. Why it is you're... Now, if you can get a conservative to think, what is the utility of the artifact to history, to anything else? That doesn't open up a flood of, 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 of rampant intervention. It just says you can make informed decisions about what is appropriate. And the point about Napoleon's weapon, it gives you a criterion. Every person who's restored something is asked the question, at what point do you exceed the legitimate limits of intervention? And why would you do so? So, for example, the idea of the object as the ultimate evidentiary source. If we replaced 
PVC, a, a cloth bound or rubber sleeved insulation in Pegasus with PVC. We don't know how or why these objects will be interrogated in the future. We don't know what questions will be asked by people in the future. Somebody may be interested in Pegasus. Somebody researching the history of paint may be interested in Pegasus because the panels, I understand, were painted by a coach builder with seven coats of livery on it. It may be completely incidental, it's a computer. If we replace rubber or cloth wound uh, um, uh, insulation with PVC, somebody may be researching the history of the introduction of PVC as insulation. How are we going to prevent them being misled by concluding that in 1959 there was PVC used in uh, insulation? So that's what the working practice are. So we draw these protocols, and the protocols are, one is, you make every alteration ideally reversible, Secondly, visible in the machine, you document it, and um, you, make, you, you, you draw attention to it as being distinct. So those are the kinds of things, ultimately ideally reversible too. Um, I haven't mentioned health and safety, and I don't trust myself to do so. <laughs> um, uh, I'll stop there. Um, the, the, the title of the lecture was sort of quite um, provocative about fight or flight, and that was at a time where we were considering whether we should take action to launch an advocacy. This was a while back when I was invited to write a title. Uh, whether, were, whether it was worth trying to reverse um, decisions about um, withdrawing support for the collection. So I'll explain what I mean by fight or flight. The first thing was we had the huge privilege of being able to put efforts into re-educating the first generation of conservatives trained in traditional archaeological model to revise or at least review their best practice protocols when applying to industrial artifacts. And that was part of a way in which, and we were fairly, we were partly successful in that, I'd say. Um, the second thing is to fight to protect Pegasus <coughs> um, and have put it public, uh, on public display. Um, Okay, this was the Science Museum. Pegasus was the only working vacuum tube machine in the world, and I was the curator of computing. As far as I'm concerned, in the long tradition of working exhibits, if Pegasus could not be on display, I was prepared to resign. I was not prepared, to, I, this was not the museum to me if that was the case. And I offered to resign. It baffles me to this day why the museum didn't accept. They would have got me and Pegasus in one go. I mean, it would be a win win. Fortunately, I was appointed assistant director and head of collections and had seniority of the people who were less joyous about the prospect of putting Pegasus on display. And from that position, it was easier actually to resolve the kinds of tensions that we involved and have it accept that it was worth putting on display. So that was what I meant by flight. Um, flight is not fleeing in the sense of being a fugitive. Flight is what I would regard as migration to warmer climes and TNMOC represents that. So that is what was meant by the flight. It's not fleeing. It's not um, going elsewhere through rejection. It's actually going to a place in which one can prosper and thrive the better. So much, how much for um, historical and social utility restorations and reconstructions? Okay, large re reconstruction problem, uh, there are large reconstruction projects and uh, restoration projects too. Invariably involve high levels of motivation, commitment. None is, out, none is without her own tales of setbacks, ingenuity, obstinacy, determination, and expertise over sustained periods of time. We applaud these and so we should. But how, as I mentioned earlier, do you convince somebody who doesn't already subscribe to the value of doing this that there is utility? And I use utility in a rather special sense. And I need to say this in case you think I'm being pretentious, which I am anyway, um, and not use the word usefulness. Utility is, comes from economics. Utility is the thing that makes it desirable to possess. So the utility of a knife is its usefulness. The utility of art is its beauty. And you have the ultimate paradox that the utility of a folly an architectural folly, folly is its uselessness. <laughs> so utility is something that is not to do with necessarily it's to do with what makes it desirable to possess. So when we ask, what is the historical utility of um, a restoration reconstruction? What is the social utility? So what makes them desirable to possess? Quite apart from whether they are practically useful or not. So I'm going to list a series of things um, that, to me, from my experience of these restorations and by observations of others, are. Um, why it is these things are desirable to do from the point of view of history. 
Firstly, they draw one into a level of intimate detail with the machine that really occurs by other means. And anyone who's been involved in it will know. It's not a question of a level of intimate detail. So we're not just talking about the architecture, the logic, the organization of the machine, which all have to be done with forensic exactitude. You're not even talking about the fact that there's a cable that runs from that connector you, to that connector. What you're talking about is pin 5 connected to pin 7. Is it a red wire or a green wire? The level of intimate detail in the machine is, is, is extreme. The granularity of your attention is, 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 is quite profound. Anyone who's been involved in this knows. <clears throat> and I thought, how can I illustrate this to you? And the thing that struck me most was the EDSAC project. And the particular thing, that if somebody was not involved in one of these projects, would like to get some sense of what is involved and the level of detail required is to do with a video that was made, which is a documentary, about the drawings for EDSAC that were rediscovered from John Loco. He, took them, he, he was part of the EDSAC 2 team. And when the machine was dismantled, he took them and put it in his cupboard. And when he heard that of the EDSAC project, he remembered he had the drawings and he brought them to Andrew Herbert, who is on the right there, who is running the stuff, who is in the, in the, who's, who's over there, who is uh, who's the project leader for this project. He brought them to him. And a video, documentary video was made for the round table meeting in which the, these drawings were evaluated. What consequences did they have for what they'd already undertaken? How much of the things, the decision they'd already made where there was incomplete information and had come to conclusions about what they should build, how much would that be affected by the new data? And that document, Chris Burton took an active part in that thing and the team was there and you couldn't do better than watch that video. It's called Rediscovery. It's on the EdSec website. It's called Rediscovering. Um, the rediscovered drawing for it, whatever it is. And if you just watch that video, you'll see the level of detail and extraordinary expertise and attention that is given to the indicate to the significance of this thing. So firstly, there's that, that to give a flavor. Uh, David Hartley said was, uh, Andrew and David were jointly responsible actually for the conception of this project, and um, Andrew is now running it. Um, the other thing that, uh, that occurred to me watching it, so for people who have not been involved, that is a, a beautiful way of seeing of seeing what kind of, what, what machine specific knowledge, the depth of the machine so needs to be brought. You need to know exactly what every transistor, what every diode, what every valve is doing, the vacuum tube is doing that. Um, the other thing that struck me was, this is the last generation of people that can bring that machine specific knowledge to this project. I was the last engineer to design the vacuum tubes. I remember designing high tension, vol high voltage power supplies for vacuum tubes taking the secondary emission from the, from, the, from the screen of a pentode to produce a regulated high tension voltage supply in parallel with the eight parameters transistors, which is the most improbable way of trying to figure out how transistor work. So, but I was the last generation to do that. And the people <coughs> sitting around the table are the last generation of machine-specific knowledge. If it isn't done now, the window is finite. And I, I was deeply struck how that documentary conveyed just what this means. The level of intimate detail, the way the restoration draws you to level of intimate detail of the object. <clears throat> Secondly is documentary completeness. That is to say, you restore a machine, you have to gather all the information. That co-location of data is archivally hugely valuable. There's the issue of new material and recovered memory. Pioneers put in front of these things. It unlocks memories they forgot they had. And that is true of EDSAC, it's true of um, the Colossus, in, uh, it's true, uh, sorry, it's true of Manchester Baby of Colossus, and I, I think it's true of EDSAC too. So you, the pioneers in being funded it unlocks memories they've forgotten they've had. <coughs> uh, the interest of, uh, instances of new material emerging, the publicity of these uh, reminds people they have stuff, stuff locked away in drawers. John Loker's uh, circuit diagrams are a case in point. He heard about the project, remembered he had the circuit diagram. <coughs> Um, there are other examples. We built the Babbage in. The Babbage, Babbage family from Australia sent me his social diaries. They sent me the books with his signatures in his, in his, uh, the social, Babbage's social diaries from 1840, they sent me, because they heard we were building an engine. So there is something about the visibility of these projects in the public domain which helps the um, uh, aggregation of these sources. There's the issue of um, recovering lost knowledge. Um, and there's also instances of archaeology, electronic archaeology that is recreating lost knowledge. And this is a project which I don't, I've always felt has not got the recognition deserved. There was no metadata or details of the contents of the 401 drum. And one of our early projects was to uh, restore 401 working order. 
And Chris and Tony read the bit stream off the drum, put it on a PC, analyzed its structure, recovered both the content and the metadata. Now this was at a time when there was a huge amount of discussion about digital curation and the, and the impermanence of magnetic media. When I was in the, in, in the, um, in the States in the microcomputer boom um, in, in, the, in the early mid-80s, I attended a seminar when Apple was trying to get the Apple, the Apple II as a corporate device, which didn't succeed in doing. Um, a seminar given to bankers, and bankers were told, bankers kept all their information on, on, on tapes in those days, they were told, do not rely on any financial information on a tape that is more longer than three years old. Here, 40 years later, they had successfully recovered magnetic data. The same is true of the Elliott 803, where tapes, which I found in a garage in Cairns from 1963, from the Elliott 803, were read successfully on the 803 restored in the old canteen. Now, this was significant to people who were worried about digital curation or longevity of magnetic data. That's not to say you can rely on it, but these were instances that were actually critical to that debate at the time. It was also the time where there was a lot of material coming out of Russia from their archives, and they had no platforms in which to read these things. Um, so that was a piece of electronic archaeology, and I don't think that, that piece of number 401 was, was really fully recognized. There's the issue of physical completeness. It's extraordinary and paradoxical that the act of acquiring a computer is often, often the most traumatic experience, physically traumatic experience in the things in life. You are, just, you are uncoupling the cables. I mean, if you're going to restore it, you've got to take them intact. When you don't restore it, you crop them. If you're not intending to restore your crop, then you should pull out the, the core stores of things and save that and chuck the rest away. It's quite a, a, a gruesome and vandalistic process to acquire a machine. And often the most traumatic uh, uh, episode in, this, in the machine's history is actually acquiring it. So physical reassembly is one thing. It reestablishes a kind of historical probity that is closer to its operating condition than would be if it were not the case. If you're restoring it, the physical... Um, 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 uh, completeness goes a stage further because it has to be electrically complete. All the connectors have to be right, all the pin pinouts need to be right, and so on. And so, even if the machine doesn't survive in perpetuity, which it won't, ultimately these machines will not be running. At least you have the confidence that when it was switched off, you have a, a confidence that it was electrically and physically complete, which is why it's rather sad that Pegasus will be dismantled when it's put in store, because you will actually be destroying a lot of the integrity, the physical integrity of that machine when it's complete. And issues of contingent and unexpected findings. When you restore these things, you think you find things you did not expect. I'll give examples from a project which I know more intimately than most, but there'll be other examples from the electronic restorations, and that is the Babbage uh, engine. Uh, that's the Difference Engine 2, designed in 1847, never built, we completed it here, it's up in the gallery, 8,000 parts, 5 tons. Um, this is a carry lever, there are 210 of those. From the drawings, we did not understand, we knew what that, uh, that claw was, we did not understand fully what these horns did under there. And yet, uh, you know, in, in, uh, we, we looked it faithfully to the drawings, and we assembled this thing and operated. We were completely dumbfounded by the subtlety of what those horns were doing. This was not expected. We did not know how fast the machine could run. It was impossible in any practical way to predict through theory or analysis what the limiting factor of its speed would be. We knew that. And, you know, so they will continue finding things we expected and did not expect. Um, um, if we could predict them, they would not have the conviction of empirical findings. They would still be speculative because they would be theoretical. Insights into contemporary ideas and practice. We know what it would be like. The tacit knowledge that comes from seeing something working. Watching Pegasus clacking away, doing its square roots, convey something that nothing else can. Um, in the, uh, Morris Wilkes said, uh, in the case of the Babbage engine, uh, that's the machine up in the gallery currently. Um, Wilkes always said that this was a daftly practical idea. But nobody said I've been able to test it. Nobody ever used this machine. OK, is it practical? Firstly. How difficult is it to turn the handle? How long can somebody turn the handle without tiring? How long would it need to be turned to get to generate a, a volume of tables? Well, we have answers to that now. We didn't have answers before. The answer is you can turn it for about 10 minutes. The second answer is you need to turn it for eight hours every day for a month to generate an average uh, uh, thing of tables. And uh, is it reliable? Is it practical? Um, what does it cost? Is it economically viable? You now have an experimental object. You can do experimental history. Not everybody accepts experimental history is legitimate. History is supposed to be how did things happen and why did people have the ideas they did, not who was right. 
But here you can actually pick up where Babbage left off. Is it practical to use this machine to generate printed mathematical tables, which is what it's designed for? How many people would this take to run? Is it economic? And so on. Um, so you get ideas into, this is experimental, but you get ideas, uh, insights in contemporary ideas and practice from running machines that have been restored from earlier times. Um, <clears throat> um, I think I have another example of that. No. Um, I thought there was a slide about, no, it's gone. Um, yes, I beg your pardon. That is a, a stereotype tray, it's an experimental printout. The output of this thing is not only hard copy printout, but a stereotype tray. The results are impressed on, on, on uh, Plaster of Paris. Now, <clears throat> the trays are there. Those are the, um, uh, they're called matrix trays. They're brass trays filled with Plaster of Paris and the, the, the punch, um, uh, the number punches come down and impress the sort. Now the question is, the consistency of the Plaster of Paris has to be fairly exact. How many people do you need to mix plaster of Paris so that you have exactly a tray with exactly the right consistency of plaster of Paris, to, not to interrupt the continuous operation of the machine? Now, if it's three or four, you, you're affecting the economics of what's going on. Now, nobody's ever been in a position to actually make these evaluations, do these assessments, or investigate this. So here's an example of insights in a contemporary, and you can revisit things that were hotly disputed in that day and try and resolve them. That's what engineers try to do. They try to resolve things through through emissions. Try to resolve issues of contention by resolved by, by uh, empirical means. Um, ultimately, these machines will not run. We're talking about archaeological timescales here. And um, one of the prospects for the survival and preservation of machines is bit-level simulation and migration from platform to platform. Um, and uh, that's the Pegasus console. This is a bit-level simulation done by Chris Burton way back. And um, one of the benefits of restoring machine working order, even if it is known that this is provisional, is firstly, you know it's state of, of physical and electrical completeness at switch off. Secondly, you can bench test the simulation, especially with respect to execution times, against the original before it's shut down. So that's another value in doing this. That's the historical utility. That's what I'd say why these things are desirable to possess from the point of view of history. The question is, there are other social elements. There are um, social reasons why you would want to do this. <clears throat> Firstly, what we've spoken about is that the social, social and the restor these restorations provide social and organizational context for experts to share expertise and extend their professional activities in historical and educationally meaningful ways to society. They have pedagogic value, both in terms of explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, and, e and exhibit or a display of these things, will have information. There is tacit information, knowledge you get from watching it work, from listening to people talk. Um, it is a focus for visitor attention. You put a Babbage engine there, you put a Pegasus machine, people ask, what is this? And immediately you have a, a question in people's minds. Why is this significant? Why is it displayed? What we were terrible, what I was very struck by was when we built the Babbage engine in public display, people were attracted to this very unusual looking object. Most of the questions were not, what is this? calculating, is this a computer? Most of the questions were, how did you make that part? They were to do with manufacture. The primary perceptions of people visiting was to do with mechanical engineering. The fact that it was a computer was, just, was, was not the, 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 the main source of questions. So you have a focus of, of, of attention um, that allows you an arena and a forum to talk about technology, to talk about how things work. They're also cultural objects. They memorialize important and extraordinary episodes, also uh, uh, the extraordinary episodes. They are monuments and placeholders for stories. You go there, you put bomb there, you ask, what is that? You've got a vehicle, a physical space in which to tell a story. And they act as generational bridges across generations. These things will be there, we hope, after we've gone. And they will raise questions. What are these things? Why are they meaningful? What is significant? And so they are placeholders for those. So these are some of the benefits that make restorations and reconstructions desirable to pursue. <clears throat> so finally, <laughs> um, the society is in rude health. Most of its activities are centered around TMSC, which to me is the embodiment of the original aspirations we have for the society. And it only remains for me to wish the society happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs>
One of the interesting points about the, the sort of social interaction is that somewhere, we hope, in a box of tape, which I think Kevin has at the moment, there's some footage that I took during the early days in the canteen. Mm. And it's a coffee break. And everybody is sitting around, and there are people who work in x-ray crystallography, <coughs> there are engineers, there are all sorts of people. And what they're talking about is the games that Pegasus could play. <laughs> Len, I saw you. Uh, Jordan, do you ever think the museum would ever release Pegasus to team off? Um, <clears throat> uh, that's one of the things I've taken away from the recent discussions, and that is, I've not discussed it, so, I, so forgive me if I reveal. <clears throat> the, a museum will only release an object to another accredited museum where they have reassurances that their protocols and best practices will be observed and that there is an accountable way of in, in, ensuring that this is the case. And uh, so what I was going to pursue, and I haven't yet discussed it with Kevin or anyone else, was what's the next step in getting TNMOC into a status that will allow these machines to be received. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that process is underway, I'd like to say. Sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm second people up in order, actually, I'm afraid. One second, Jim. Thanks. So, is, that, is that working? Yes. Yep, good, good, thank you. Uh, Jim Brooks, um, I'd just like to go back to the uh, early stages, uh, Doran, of the um, Information Age Project, if I may. Excellent presentation, really enjoyed it. But in the early days, you mentioned you had this nice budget to get off with a degree of autonomy. And I think it might be worth just explaining how those hard-headed chief execs of the ICT industry happen to provide that money into the channel that you were so able, ably able to use, yeah? Um, at the time, should I stand up, is that easier? At the time I was chief executive of the British Computer Society, I was also a trustee of the Information Age Project. And I happened to be uh, alongside Neil Cousins, who was also a, a trustee of the Information Age Act. A project, and we were also trustees on another body of the young engineer design awards. So I knew Neil quite well. John Fairclough was also um, a past president of BCS, was also a trustee, and by then he was Mrs. Thatcher's uh, chief scientist. So apart from us three, basically, it was the hairy backed industrialists with lots of money. The project got going because the planning commission was given by Reading and Berkshire to a developer called uh, Spayhawk, uh, Trevor, Trevor Osborne Spayhawk. Uh, one of the planning game conditions was that there was a, a building amongst the thing which was going to be filled with the Microsoft and Oracles and all that. And it now is, of course, a long time later. But at that time, that was the plan. High-tech uh, business park, lots of, lots of buildings with the uh, high-tech industries. But there was this particular building was going to be for public benefit, both operation and, and, and service provision. And we had this a link with the Science Museum where there was going to be augmentation of the Science Museum galleries. But the main, if you like, the glamorous <coughs> bit for the industrialists was this magnificent building, which I think was costed out of about 20 million in those days. And the number of organizations that went forward, including BT, which I think you didn't mention, but the others were ICT and the ones you mentioned, um, some of them offered to put five million into this project and they, as part of their commitment, provided 10%. So all the 10% were in the kitty at the Information Age project, owned by the trustees. And everything was going swimmingly. We still didn't know what the building was going to be quite like. You had a brilliant summary book. There was a lot of ideas about a living museum that could showcase all the stuff so that the industrialists would get some benefit about the generic benefits of IT, etc. Um, but then we had that rather nasty recession which hit so many of us in so many bad ways. And of course, most of the companies couldn't fulfill the remaining 90% of their contribution in 1989. 
And so we had this budget, money, and there was no way. Spayhawk went bust. Trevor Osborne vanished off the scene as we surfaced later, do more developments. But um, the, uh, the, the, the thing was that there was this money, and we felt that it would be a good idea to use it for public good. Uh, the, some of the organisations involved wanted their money back because, uh, but once all the dust had settled and all the bits that were owed by the project were paid off, the residual monies were in fact passed over and used to such good effect by Doran and his colleagues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a gentleman over this side. Thank you very much. Um, so I, was, I was quite interested with the, the objects and curatorial care and, and when you decide to, um, whatever investigation you do on an object to, to gain some understanding of it. And let's face it, if it's a computing object, then you have to really use it, as you say, to, to understand it. But, you know, the, the, there always seems to be this dichotomy between preserving it for somebody who's coming after you and investigating it yourself. How do you decide whether the utility of, of a, a current investigation um, justifies the uh, damage, if I can use that word, that you're going to do to the integrity of the, the object? Um, that, that to me seems a, a huge dichotomy to any curator. And the fact that um, the skills to investigate it are disappearing, uh, whereas the techniques to investigate it are, are increasing. Sorry, I, I hope I've put that succinctly. Yes. I've struggled to get that into a sentence, but uh, would you like to make any comments yes. on that? Uh, by investigation, you mean restoring to working order? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, what do you mean by investigation? Well, mm. you, you, were you were talking about looking at paint. Let's take, a, take that example. In order to investigate the paint, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. Yes. you may have yes. to remove it. Yes, 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 yes. In which okay. case, you would destroy the integrity of the object. Okay. Uh, in computing, yes, you would probably have to, because a computer isn't a piece of hardware. A computer is hardware and software, and the only way to investigate the object as a whole yes. would be to put mm. the software on it and run it. But the, you know, in the more general sense, investigating paintwork would involve removal of paintwork. I mean, I'll, I'll answer the part of that question, that is to say, I have never yet heard a defensible case made to give a credible reason why running a computer, by restoring to be working and running it, compromises that object as an evidentiary source. And the reason for the Napoleon Whitecoat part is it allows you to separate the idea of you either keep it physically intact completely and don't touch it, if the idea is that the, the, the machine is sacrosanct and you don't touch it and you preserve therefore all the predicates that are the signature of its making and its time and its history remain intact, then you don't touch it. But if you regard that thing as, as an evidentiary source, then, you need, then the beauty of Napoleon's waste it allows you to ask what category of questions will future interrogators be misled by its alteration? In other words, how have you compromised it as an evidentiary source? Now, if there's other paint there, you could say, well, it's a cosmetic alteration, and you haven't changed it, because there will still be paint from which somebody else to do a different portion So it's a question of a case-by-case -case basis. There is no protocol that is absolute saying, this level of intervention in this instance is appropriate, and that level of intervention applies to all such circumstances. And the beauty is to have a criterion which says, and the criterion is, why are you preserving it in the first instance? And you're preserving it is because the ways in which these machines are inter will be interrogated is unforeseeable. That, that, was, that was my whole problem. Yes. You can't actually proceed. Yes. And, and therefore. That's why you need blanket Do you act now and preserve it because you can't? Mm. And it, it, it will always be unforeseeable. Yeah, so In the case of computers, I would say I don't know of an instance. I would give you love for somebody to give an example of how running a machine will change its value as an inventory source. So, oh my God, the disk is going to crash. Right? There is a duplicate new disk. Secondly, what is it about that disk? that you can tell from an uncrashed disk and a crashed disk that is going to change any conclusion you would come to. Because that is, so the beauty of that is it allows you to ask those questions in a way that allows you to come to a judgment about whether it's appropriate to run the machine or not. And I've yet to hear an argument that says the value of this artifact as an evidentiary source in the light of unforeseeable inquiry is compromised by running it. Um, I, I, I can see Adrian and Charles, but this is gentlemen first, and then Dick. 
a, a, gro a grossly simplistic suggestion, no doubt fraught with politics, but uh, can, could not the Science Museum be persuaded to have a sub-branch <coughs> on the same campus as TN MSC so that the change of ownership question doesn't actually arise? <laughs> uh, I mean, the logical thing, given that the, the, the important, I think it was in the late, 18, 18, late 1980s, where the crossover point between the value of the IT and computing industry exceeded that of oil and cars. So you'd say, well, actually, there's a railway museum in Bradford. Shouldn't there be a science museum, computer museum? <laughs> and uh, the, the natural way to do that would actually to be have a specialist computer museum on a, in the national grid. Um, and that would solve the problem. It's kiss of death, but, uh, but you've got security. Um, uh, Adrian Johnson, Royal Holloway. Um, yeah, I remember the protocols and the discussions around whether to leave a piece of insulating tape on the front panel of our BDPA. What I wanted to ask you about, though, was that there's a, there's a parallel culture which is conditioned by money and public interest to ours, and that's the railway preservation movement. And they drive a coach and horses through everything that you've just described. We have machines which are on loan from the National Railway Museum to preserve railways where they're driven, in some cases by idiots. We've had, we've had cylinders blown up because somebody didn't open the cylinder cocks. You know, how is it that these two cultures exist so... I mean, I know you knew John Van Riemsdyk and, uh, and Tony Hallpatch. How is it that they got away with it, but the dead hand of the conservator has constrained so much restoration activity in electronics, where, as you just eloquently <coughs> said, the consequences of an idiot are quite light compared to with the 100 ton steam engine. Um, as far as this museum goes, I would say <coughs> that if an object is inventory, it's subject to those formidable protections. If an object is not in, uh, inventory, one can do almost anything like it. Um, the, the reason motor car restorers we're another extreme of people who do extreme restorations. There's some very little original left in many motor cars. And the question is, do you want it to look in pristine contemporary condition, or do you want it to re keep the predicates of its, of its age? Um, and that is because uh, motor car restoration programs are in private hands, and they're unregulated by any reference to the state. So I'd say there's a distinction between the state-run organizations, which are accountable in this way, and the and organizations which are not state-run. Um, if there are um, locomotives, that are inventory, that are being run. Oh, there are many. Yeah, many. Then I would say, then that, that reminds me that the curator still ha can make a judgment, that the curator is still the determined, the decision taker to balance the utility with the social, historical, technical, uh, that the curator used to make that judgment. Um, uh, here, that, that those, those uh, controls being transferred. So I would say in relation to a local mm -hmm. motive that's in the national collections being run in this way, Curator has made a decision that says the overall utility of doing this uh, and that the educational whatever value, the social value of doing that, um, uh, uh, is worth uh, the, the consequences to the fabric of the thing. Charles, I saw you earlier and I'm going to dip. Yes, I'd like to make some comment about the subject of what an engineer is, which you raised. I am an engineer. I feel like an engineer. My gut feeling is that I'm an engineer. And as everybody points out, you'll point it out, and um, museum creators will point it out, this country has built on the success of its engineers over the last 200 years. Fine. The question of the issue is how we bring up the next generation of engineers. Because if we don't, the prosperity of the country will cease. So we have this, well, engineering science, we have this nice word STEM, science, techno technology, engineering, and mathematics. It applies to them all. Everybody plays lip service to it. We must encourage our children to take an interest in it. How do we go about it? The first uh, issue is schools. And people are trying to uh, uh, get the school curriculum to emphasize these things and they're finding it much here struggle. But another source that ought to be encouraging our upcoming children to take an interest in engineering and science and so on is the museums. And again, they will pay lip service to it and say, yes, we know this is important. 
But if you want to interest a child in engineering, or science, or mathematics, then you have to be an engineer, or scientist, or mathematics, because they're the only people who understand what is really about. Now, if you go to a museum, how many people are there, there who actually understand what it is they're supposed to be putting across? Now, when you started in the business, the answer was clear. You were uh, as an engineering attitude. You had 120 people in your basement, or all engineers. The culture was there. Now, as you say, and the <coughs> curators are all historians. The museum I have a work in, as far as I know, employs nobody with an engineering scientific or scientific background that can even understand the proposals put to them for how they should uh, disseminate this sort of information. That is the extent of the problem that we're facing. It's gone out of fashion. Now, in, in the museum where I'm, I'm working, the only person with whom I, it's no use trying to have a technical discussion with any curator. The only person I can have any reasonable technical discussion with is actually the conservator. Because the conservator is in its essence technologist. And I have had very good advice from the conservator. I, I realize I'm working on a machine which is a little object, and I try to maintain it in its original state as far as me then. It has to be modified, and I'm doing all the right things I hope. But I've got the engineering background and feel for it, and I hope I've got the feel for what a museum should be doing to be able to do it properly. But the environment I found in, I find myself in, makes this exceedingly difficult and uphill struggle. Unless the museums have people within them who understand what the fundamentals of the science, engineering, mathematics is, how can they possibly expect to bring up the next generation of children to follow in their footsteps? That is the question. And at the moment, the museums seem to be going in marching in totally the opposite direction. I think there'd be a lot of sympathy for that in this, in this room. Great deal from me anyway. Um, thank you, Doran, for your kind remarks about resurrection. I'll make two points very briefly, if I may. Firstly, that the programme that you see on the front cover is not just any old piece of programme. It's taken from the revised report on the algorithmic language, possibly the most influential publication on software there has <laughs> ever been. Uh, secondly, um, this particular edition will drop onto your doormats, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. It contains an article about CIRAC. Uh, for those of you who don't know, CIRAC is the 1949 computer built in Sydney, Australia, um, and it's now preserved. Um, they deal with the very questions that you've been talking about in this article, top of page 27, uh, in which they say they made a positive decision not to restore CIRAC because they would inevitably have to alter it. Um, and after a while, the expertise to continue to maintain that machine would go, and they would be left then with a machine which was not only not working, but also not original. But these are questions <coughs> which happen to have engaged people all the way from here to Melbourne. Uh, this is not something unique to us. Um, I'll come back to you, Roger. And then Alan. <laughs> Stack overflow in a minute, John. <laughs> John Harper. Uh, just a dilemma. If you have a typewriter uh, or a teletype and you decide to stop, uh, snowball it, um, put it away, but you know that in the past they've oiled the bearings with an acidic oil and you know darn well that that oil is going to tear away all the brass bearings. If you don't do something about it soon, what do you do about it? <laughs> shall, shall I wait for you to answer that in detail? <laughs> is, that, is that a question about not having contemporary lubricants? <laughs> it's just a dilemma I'm talking about. What do you do? 
guidelines on this country to put some guidelines. I can say use some, some, some new oil. Yeah, take a part to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Doran, just briefly, thank you for a fascinating time. Uh, picking up to some extent Adrian Johnson's uh, comment, um, I, I fear I'm another one addicted to steam locomotives. Um, but I think there's a, a point to be taken and which needs to be addressed, and that is most industrial archaeological artifacts were continuously modified through their working life. When I look at one of my beloved steam locomotives, the boiler that is on it is not the one it had on day one. It probably doesn't have the tender that it had on day one. Um, all the wheels uh, have been turned round and, and so on. The cylinders, uh, Adrian, as you know as well as I do, uh, may well have been uh, either replaced or at least heavily sort of rebored and relined and so on. Um, it, it's not like a Leonardo da Vinci paint, uh, painting which is being done. These were living things and as engineers discovered how to make them better they were endlessly rebuilt. So there is a sense in which at least when it comes to these sorts of artifacts the heritage railway community is actually not a museum, they are simply continuing to use these artifacts to create a heritage experience of travelling on a steam train. And if you take that view, then these engines are not in a museum, um, they're simply continuing the life they always led and being endlessly maintained. Yes, it's a, I mean, I say it's a decision, these are not absolutes. Somebody could make that decision and it's perfectly legitimate. We've got one time for one more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, John, in your watch on the in charge of collections, you will have accumulated a number of objects, and a lot of these objects that curators have, there are more that they will end up looking at, and the Science Museum has a large collection of computer objects stored in Rotten, and they're either being subject to great, gracious delay or willful neglect. Now, why, why I'd like to just ask for any comment on should you, that view, should you moderate the rules by which they release that stuff before it just generates into a pile of dust? Um, there are performance indicators in the government um, uh, funding agreements to do with the maintenance of artifacts. So if they're degrading, then this is something that one can, there are legitimate channels to make representations about. Uh, I'm not saying whether it is the case that they're degrading or not, because I'm quite sure they are. But, but there, there is a funding agreement obligation to maintain existing collections. The question of um, releasing these in the wild, as it were, the question of um, transferring um, custodial attention to another institution depends on the status of that institution. They will do it. They will make a loan to it, and that with agreed protocols and orders. But it has to be another established museum where they are satisfied that the same uh, protocols for best practice um, will apply as they do in a national museum. Um, so the degradation is lamentable. I mean, the 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 the, the, Besom, uh, the Besom sex that I brought back from from uh, Novosibirsk in Siberia was brought back with a view to restoring it. So the canvas uh, vents for the cooling are there. All the connectors are there. All the documentation in Russian is there. All the peripherals, the tapes, everything is there with a view to restoration. Um, these were left when I opened them. They found there were rats in them. This is often being quarantined by the conservators for infestation issues. Um, the, 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 the levels of... Um, I don't like seeing grown men cry. I could tell you stories about the abuse of Pegasus that had fallen in the hands of these people, wrested from the care of the, of the, of the society. And, uh, I, I, I will say one thing. Uh, you saw that the ceiling of the, of the, um, of the old canteen is quite low. Um, well, after the keys for our cupboards were taken from us, because the conservatives were now responsible for them, not the curators or even the CTS. I know there were instances when Chris came from distant things and came there, the person who had the keys wasn't even on site. And this is her idea. Um, the, the CTS cared for those objects really very, very well. Um, as the, uh, the controls transferred from curators to conservatives, they had control. We had no control anymore. 
And um, I came off leave one day, I parked in the car park and went to the old canteen. The building was open to the road on Queensgate. It had been gutted. <coughs> there were contractors standing on the Pegasus desk desks put to get access to the panels upstairs. The trained literature that I got from the National, from, uh, um, National Physical Laboratory, which is every known advertising sheet for a computer available from the 1951 onwards, were in open spots <coughs> strewn on the floor, taken out of the library to be looked at by the conservators and abandoned. The person who was responsible for that building had retired. Nobody asked what his responsibilities were. This is a machine in a national collection in the care of a computer whose care had been wrested from the CCS. So when you tell me things are degrading and rotten, I can only say there is a funding agreement that should in terms of which one could appeal about that and say that there are funds available to do this and the job is not being done properly. As far as transfer, we were in the, the, the requirements of transferring to an institution that would guarantee for the museum satisfaction that the working practice and protocols would be the same as they would be in the National Museum. Otherwise, they're perfectly entitled on the data. Otherwise, they have to trust us. And all the movement from 1990 onwards is that accountability is through process, not through professionalism. So, the Dutch tells us that electronic stuff kept in duck. Absolutely. Called it is better for the machine to have it run. Another final question. I'm sorry, yes. Say first of the pub. Hello, Ryan Agashi from Germany. Oh, the micro is working. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Um, I was comparing mentally the state of the archaeologists uh, who were digging Schliemann uh, uh, in Greece and uh, the people in Crete who uh, created, recreated the palace of Knossos. And I was wondering where we are, because uh, I think we are in a certain, we were in a certain state when we uh, were uh, as light-minded, let's say, as Schliemann and the other people. Uh, caring about uh, uh, the stuff that we uh, analyze, we take. And so, the, so, what is the consequence out of it? There was much damage, but it, uh, uh, there was the uh, beginning of uh, giving money to people who investigated the archaeology. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is the consequence of it? Uh, you were very clear that whenever you do something, you change something. And uh, the other example was if we let the same uh, everything as it is, uh, it will might be de uh, deteriorated. And if we leave something in the ground from the archaeological point of view, uh, it may be better conserved uh, than we dig it out, but at some time we have to dig it out. So I think for our point of view, the, the thing that we have to do now is to collect as much information as we can, especially from the people still living. So I think that must, must, and this is partially best done by recreating um, uh, copies or by putting uh, machines uh, into work again. But the ultimate thing must be that we collect the information together. I, uh, uh, some years ago, I asked the Science Museum for some documentation for the ACE simulator. It took some time, and I had to ascertain that, that the information exists. Uh, but in every museum, something is lost. So the ultimate thing is have all these things collected, get people who were working with them, tell about them, collect the materials in a way that cannot be lost again and uh, uh, leave the things and decide, as you said, it, decide on a case-by-case -case view uh, whether it is better to preserve it or better to build something new or whatever the decision is, but it is a decision to be done from point to point. I agree absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Doran, for such a worthy 25th presentation really? and sort of for, for me to hear about the history and for you to highlight the personalities and the key players. That was fascinating and also so much food for thought in the um, 
two-thirds later part of your talk. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>